Allah Rabbil Alameen wa Salaam wa Salaam wa Sayyidina wa Ala Muhammad wa Ala Alihi wa Zawaji wa Zuriyati Ajma'in We are looking at Islam, Maulana Maududi's uh, Islamic Constitutionalism and so far we have looked at the positive uh, contributions of Maulana Maududi to, uh, the, to, to the Islamic thought but now we are going to look at the problematic aspects of his uh, political thinking or his political philosophy. And we are going to start from here. Despite, I think we, we had lost or we had touched on this, but we will just go over it again. Despite... Um, this insistence on Islam's completion and uniqueness, which we discussed earlier. These are two unique completeness and uniqueness of Islam as a system, as a civilization. This is the positive and um, very important contribution of Malan Wadudi to modern Islamic thought. Despite this insistence on Islam's completion, Islam is a complete system, a complete and unique system, which is incompatible with any non-Islamic frame of references and other civilizations. Muhammad endorses the use of liberal discourses. Use of liberal discourses and institutions, not just discourses, uh, not just institution, but uh, not just discourses, but institutions as well as political technology. And obviously, there's no harm in in principle of using anything from other civilizations but it depends on what are those things we are, which we are using and how are we using them okay so that's very important okay there are a few things here so when you're using other discourses as well as institutions either or or both so in principle there is no harm in using in principle political or any other technologies from other civilization in principle but the main thing is, there are two main things about this use. What are those things which we are using? What is their nature? What is their nature? What is their nature? Because there might be some things which the nature is such that they are incompatible in Islamic civilization. And those things which are incompatible with Islamic civilization, even those can, it doesn't mean that we have to reject them. Uh, in toto, so even those things which are incompatible with Islamic, even those things in principle can be divided into two categories. First, you can still use them, but before you use them, you would have to deconstruct them. And then you can use different parts of 
within Islamic civilization. And in principle, there can be things which you can't even, after that, you can't use them. Okay. So, when we want to use something, the first question is to determine what is the nature of that thing. Because without understanding the nature of that thing, using that can be dangerous. Dangerous in the sense that it can be, uh, you know, uh, against, um, you can compromise your core values. So, so you have to understand the nature and then you can ask them whether they are compatible with the Islamic civilization and its values or incompatible. And even if they are incompatible, we, we, we don't want to reject them out of them. And even those things, we can then see whether they, you know, are usable after deconstruction. And there, there might be some things which are not usable even after uh, deconstruction. And by use, we are use we are using this use in non-instrumental sense, because when we use something, we can use it as something you know worthy in itself, and we can use it as an instrument as well. So this you the word use is not used here in in, in any uh, reductionist instrumentalist sense. Okay. So the first thing is, and then the question is how. Yeah. And then the question is how? So what are those things we are using? That's the first thing. And the second question is how are we using them? Um, the question of how is very wide ranging. And what I would say here would be just uh, just the tip of the iceberg. Tip of the iceberg. And this question need to be studied on its own um, at the conceptual level as well as at the practical level. So how do we so? So we can use things which are compatible with Islam. Even then the question is how will we use them? And one general broad principle which we can imagine is when we use things there can be two situations what is the situation that's very important and the context but the islamic civilization is dominant or is weak and overwhelmed that's the main question what's the context so i think um, using principles and technologies and concepts in a situation when Islamic civilization is dominant, where the institutions are overwhelmingly Islamic, where the society is Islamic, where the political power belongs to Islam, would have totally different uh, implication than using some values when Islam is weak, when the education system is not Islamic, where Islam is not socially dominant, where the institutions are not Islamic. Because in, in the latter case, things you are using, their meaning would be largely determined by largely and necessarily determined by the by the uh, by the dominant context and in order to use principles and technologies 
in those in that circumstance we will need to do double deconstruction deconstruction at the level of ideas and deconstruction at the level of uh, application as well so I, I think these are a few just broad a uh, uh, few broad conceptual consideration when we talk about using something alien whether it is political technology or physical technology uh, within Islamic civilization okay okay so despite the insistence on Islamic um, uh, despite the insistence on Islam's completion and uniqueness Mawla Maududi endorses liberal liberal discourses and in and institution as a political technology and I think one of the reason Mawla Maududi makes a lot of mistake in this context is because he doesn't do these two things which we just discussed he doesn't try to to deeply understand liberal discourses at the philosophical and institution at the philosophical level and at the foundational level and he doesn't consider the question of deconstruction and he doesn't uh, consider the question of context And obviously, this is not to blame him, you know, not that, you know, one person can't do everything. So it, it is the duty of the letter, his successors to, you know, continue his work. And one of the reason um, this work couldn't be done was that people thought that what Mala Madhudi said was, you know, sufficient and now we just need to implement his ideas but that's never the case and that's one of the mistake which islamic uh, groups and islamic school of thought make that they consider the work of their own uh, scholars or their own uh, guiding lights as self-sufficient that's why every Islamic school needs always needs to learn from the Islamic school and fill their shortcomings and their limitations with borrowings from other schools so we it's strange that we are happy to actually borrow from the modernist uh, civilization with the but we we are very <laughs> hesitant to borrow from other Islamic schools and it's, it's a bit ironic so now we go to the things which he has actually borrowed so basically what the, the notion the conception of or the what he has borrowed from the modern discourse is democracy and he basically tried to Islamize democracy or try to provide an Islamic uh, version of democracy and obviously he thinks that it is compatible with Islam and mistake there is mainly uh, from two sides Mawlana Madhudi's mistake there is from two sides so when we talk about Islamic democracy and it's not just Mawlana Madhudi's mistakes but this mistake is being made even today by Muslim scholars and Muslim thinkers and Islamic movements so the first mistake is I think he has misunderstood what democracy actually is or I should say he hasn't understood what dem democracy is at the deeper philosophical conceptual and foundational level and that's the case with a lot of muslim 
most Muslim scholars and thinkers, even today. And um, and those people who have those scholar, traditional scholars who have actually criticized the conception of democracy, they have criticized it from a narrow. Um, and I'm I'm not using narrow here is in in any negative sense or derogatory sense, but narrow to just to a demarcate something from a, na a narrow fiqhi perspective. Like those who actually reject democracy or try to assess democracy, they try to do it from whether it is halal or haram. But what we need is uh, more, uh, not not the fi fiqhi assessment, but f assessment from the perspective of Islamic uh, from the perspective of the spirit of Islam. In the same way in which, for example, Imam Ghazali in Ahiyya, he, he assesses all the Islamic uh, concept from a, from a perspective of the spirit or the or the objectives, uh, general objectives of Islam from the from a, from a perspective of Ihsan or from a perspective of the Tasawwuf, if you want to call it that. Uh, and not just halal and haram, because something can be halal even. <laughs> but being halal doesn't mean that it is how it should be. Because halal, being halal is just a min, minimum threshold. And the fiqh perspective uh, doesn't take into con considerations the context as such. Even even though you know when you make fiqh judgment, you do take into con consideration the con context, but the context you look at it is itself narrow fiqh context and not the uh, broader civilizational context. Okay. So the mistake Mawal Madhudi makes at the level of Islamic from its, you know, in formulating its conception of Islamic democracy is, on the first hand, he doesn't understand the modern contemporary democracy at the foundational philosophical level. And from Islamic perspective, what he... The mistake he makes is that he tries to drive um, a political Islamic conception directly from Quran and Sunnah without considering the Islamic tradition, classical works in Islamic political philosophy and fiqh and all that. He doesn't context contextualizes. He doesn't contextualizes theorization of democracy in the context of the tradition of Islamic uh, discipline and Islamic in the tradition of al ulum al islamiya and if he had done that uh, at least partially he would have uh, found that his uh, so because uh, Islamic um, disciplines and Islamic, the tradition of Islamic uh, disciplines and Islamic um, discourses actually delimit uh, actually uh, gives you the context 
So if you if you if you are trying to understand Quran and Sunnah and the concept within it in the context of Islamic uh, disciplines, then that will delimit or that will delimit the context of your theorization and your theoretical formulation than your understanding in the context of Islamic civilization. On the other hand, if you are if you ignore Islamic uh, discipline and Islamic uh, Uluma al ulum al Islamia fiqh usul fiqh um, classical works in political philosophy like uh, the work of Imam al Haramain or work work of Ibn Taymiyyah or work of Imam Ghazali and uh, Imam Yusuf and all those who have written on Islamic political discourses and and the political is uh, the dis uh, and the Islamic um, uh, principles which uh, are formulated in fiqh and usul fiqh if we ignore them then your understanding of Quran and Sunnah would be actually delimited by not by Islamic civilization but by the current dominant civilization because that is your context that is your under contextual understanding anyway especially if you're dealing with it like you're already, you know, studying what democracy is and you're impressed by that. And then you go and look for Islamic uh, understanding about that or Islamic insights about that democracy without delimiting your understanding or without con contextualizing your understanding in the context of Islamic discipline, then you are going to be necessarily delimited and influenced by the dominant cultural and political and philosophical context, which is the context of liberal democracy. Okay. <clears throat> and that's why his conception of Islamic de democracy is of a political order in which every individual is is an equal, Im equal important, oh, sorry, equal participant in Khilafat and in which all individuals enjoy equal status as citizens. So, uh, when you haven't looked at uh, the modern political discourse in the context of Islamic disciplines, then your concepts are citizen, citizenry and equality, equality and participation and individualism. And then you, if you look into Quran and Sunnah, then your concept of participation and citizen and equality and individual individualism is being influenced by the current discourses rather than the Islamic disciplines. So Islamic democracy is of a political order which in, in which everybody is uh, in Islamic order. Every individual is Khalifa. And then, well, Khalifa, you, and what Khalifa is, you you all you will also define uh, in the context of the modernist discourse rather than in the context of Islamic disciplines, because you haven't considered this debate in the context of the Islamic disciplines. All individual Khalifa delegate their so the conception of delegation in their power of Khalifa to the former ruler for administrative purposes. So that's how you provide uh, a justification for Islamic democracy. But that Islamic uh, Islam there is uh, just an adjective. The real thing is democracy, because democracy is actually determining what Islam is rather than the Islamic discipline. And that's partially the outcome of your methodology. So the concept which you are Islamizing here are, or partially uh, Islamizing it are the concept of
take the concept of the concept of individualism concept of equality obviously in islam there is a concept of individuality and equality but that is totally different concept but because you have drive your concepts from modern political discourse and then try to understand islamic perspective on those concepts directly through quran or sunnah without contextualizing them in the context of the islamic disciplines traditional islamic discipline that's why your understanding of the quran is at least being partially determined by the modern political discourse because that modern political discourse is the dominant discourse so even if you are not doing it obviously you are not trying to do that and you are not conscious of it otherwise you wouldn't have done it because you as we saw Malin Odudi was not a modernist uh, in principle he considered Islam as a complete and unique civilization and if you consider Islam as a complete and unique civilization then in principle you are not modern but practically you are a modernist in the sense that you are justifying modernism in certain aspects because of your faulty methodology um, so his uh, concept of uh, individual in, individualism concept of equality concept of citizenship and concept of delegation and concept of uh, i think uh, in behind all these the if you are if the main main concept which you are actually um, legitimizing or is a concept of freedom and autonomy i think that those are your main concepts and if those are your main concept even if you understand those concept within the limits of islam you are going to be a liberal modernist uh, because the core concept of islam is not freedom or autonomy so so that's here uh, the core concept of islam is actually worship and subjugation of your will heteronomy not autonomy so so i think it would be let's let's look at it a bit so in modernity whether it's liberal modernity or and in the context of Maulana Madhudi it's a liberal democracy or liberal modernity because he is he is impressed by liberal modernity he is not that that much impressed by socialism the core concept is freedom and autonomy freedom autonomy and uh, autonomy is a specific conception of freedom I mean self determination so obviously Mawlana Madhudi doesn't accept autonomy uh, without limits that's why he's a Muslim and not a you know pure liberal but he does it in at least in his political discourse autonomy is the central value and Islam plays the role of limiting autonomy limiting autonomy so autonomy is the at least practically speaking autonomy is the core value and what is limiting that islam is an instrument in that sense or the vehicle of or the formal limitation of that autonomy or the disciplining of that autonomy on the other hand an islamic revolutionary perspective or islamic perspective is not autonomy but heteronomy 
and specifically uh, worship and surrender of your will to the will of that's the center and freedom and autonomy can be instrument of in certain of this core value but they can't be core value so Maulana Madhudi has changed the whole uh, configuration here and all those people who you know Islamic uh, liberals and Mal Madhudi, uh, not in principle, but practically he is an Islamic liberal. Nobody can deny that. Um, a lot of Islamic movements of modern Muslimin in Arab world is even worse. Uh, and Islamists like, even those who have deep, uh, deeper Islamic learning as well, like Muqtah Shinkiti, for example, his kitab, if Azmatul Dusuriya Fil Islam or something like Fil Hazaratul Islamiya. If you read that, that's even worse. Um, so that's that's the thing uh, for an Islamic liberal. Autonomy is the core, and Islam is just limiting that autonomy. But for a Muslim, traditional Muslim and Islamic revolutionary, autonomy specifically worship and subjugating your will to Allah that's the core and everything else is the instrument of that and what guides how much you know when you reject or so so um rejecting rejecting freedom uh, and autonomy is no problem for us and equality and freedom and individuality and citizen they can be you know some kind of instrumental value if needed but they are not the guiding principle or guiding value but practically for Mawlana Maududi, they become the, and for all Islamic liberals, they become the guiding value. And the civilization which emerges is not the Islamic civilization. Islamic liberal civilization where Islam is an instrument of liberalism. A, li, uh, a partial limitation of liberalism. And that's allowed by uh, liberal tradition. And as liberal tradition recognizes, uh, you know, short-term uh, limitations are no limitations in the long run, in a sense. Anyway, we'll stop here and we'll continue from here, inshallah.